Welcome to Worship with St. Paul's United Church for Sunday, September the 6th. We are so glad you're here, whether you're joining us virtually or whether you, uh, for the first time, or whether you come here all the time, you are welcome in this space. As we gather here, we know that we gather on traditional and sacred land, and we begin our service today by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Neutral Peoples. And we gather in hope and in faith in the work that we do together towards right relationship with our brothers and sisters and the first peoples of this land. As we gather here, we also know that we gather in a light and our light of Christ has already been lit, that reminder and symbol of our faith and that one who when people asked him, who are you? He said, I am the light of the world. And I want to do a special welcome and introduction as we begin our service today. I'm going to ask our lovely uh, musician here to come and stand up so that you can officially welcome and on behalf of the church council the ministry and personnel committee of saint paul's united church we are so pleased to welcome dr erica raymond as our full-time music director we are excited that although we only had a few sundays in the sanctuary before covid 19 moved us online to have experienced her talent and personality and we know that that's already had a positive impact on our worship services so we thank you so much for being with us, Erica. Erica is an accomplished pianist. She instructs at Brock University, and we're grateful for the inspiration and assistance that she's been providing all throughout our pandemic. So, yay. I'll clap on behalf of everybody else. So thank you, Erica, and an official welcome to you. And another announcement, uh, throughout our pandemic, we haven't quite had uh, a lot of inspiration and creativity going on around our children's programming, but I want to announce an exciting opportunity that we have had come up uh, to work with the GO Project on uh, some online programming for our children and our young ones so uh, and our teenagers. So keep an eye out for that. We're going to have um, information coming to you soon about that as well. And now I invite us to center ourselves. Wherever you were gathered this day, I invite you to center yourselves, to place your feet firmly on the ground and know that we, wherever we are, are together. And as we gather from wherever we are this day to worship God, may we hear God's word anew. And as we gather, we gather to follow Jesus and to pray that actions we take in our lives would reflect the example that he set. And as we gather, we pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the one that works through us to serve those in need. And so, as we gather, come let us worship in faith and in hope. Let us follow and let us serve this day. And as we gather, we sing, come let us sing, Voices United, number 222. Brothers and sisters will grow in the fulfillment. 
building of they know. Desert shall plume. And now I invite us into a time of centering ourselves with prayer and invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Creator, we thank you for gathering us together from wherever we are this day. We pray that you would hold us in your love as we hear your word this day and as we seek to be people of deeper understanding, understanding of one another and understanding of you. May the purpose and the example set out before us in Jesus Christ be our example today and always. And in his name we pray as we say together the prayer that he taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now we turn to the wisdom of the scriptures. We started last week, our first Sunday, by making the road by walking with Brian McLaren. And we continue along that journey this week in a theme of creation and the theme of being human. And so I invite you to hear the second of the creation stories found in the book of Genesis that say, And that is how the universe was created. When the Lord God made the universe, there were no plants on the earth and no seeds had sprouted, because God had not sent any rain. And there was no one to cultivate the land, but water would come up from beneath the surface and water the ground. Then the Lord God made some soil from the ground and formed man out of it, and he breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils, and the man began to live. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man he had formed. He made all kinds of beautiful trees grow and produce good fruit. In the middle of the garden stood the tree that gives life and the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. A stream flowed in Eden and watered the garden, and beyond Eden it divided into four rivers. The first, Pishon, flowing around the country of Havilah. Pure gold is found there, and rare perfume and precious stones. The second river is the Gishon, and it flows around the country of Cush. The third, the Tigris, flowing around east of Assyria, and the fourth, the river of Euphrates. Then the Lord God placed the man in the garden to cultivate it and guard it, and he said to the man, You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you might die the same day. And then the Lord said, It is not good for the man to live alone, so I will make a suitable companion for him. And so God took soil from the ground and formed all the animals and all the birds. Then he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And that is how they first got their names. And so the man named all the birds and the animals, but none of them was a suitable companion to help him. And so God made the man fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the flesh. And he formed a woman out of the rib and brought her to him. And the man said, at last, here is one of my own kind, bone taken from bone and flesh from my flesh. Woman is her name because she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother united and they become one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading this morning is from the gospel according to Mark. Then Jesus went back to the synagogue, where there was a man who had a paralyzed hand. Some people were there who wanted to accuse Jesus of doing wrong, so they watched him closely to see whether he would cure the man on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man, come up here to the front. 
Then he asked the people, what does the law allow us to do on the Sabbath, to help or to harm, to save someone's life or to destroy it? But they did not say a thing. Jesus was angry as he looked around at them, but at the same time he felt sorry because they were so stubborn. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it became well again. And so the Pharisees left the synagogue and met at once with some members of Herod's party, making plans to kill Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, and please pray with me. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Neither one of our scripture passages this morning are exactly easy for us to reconcile with. And yet we need to unpack them. We need to think a little bit critically about them and how they apply to us here and now. And Brian McLaren says, two eyes are better than one because they make depth perception possible. And the same goes with ears. Two ears make it possible to locate the direction of a sound. And we often say that two heads are better than one because we might get insight from multiple perspectives that adds to the wisdom that we want to impart. Well, the same is true with stories. We need to look at them critically and not just as one, but as part of a whole and a collective. And we can nest things of the Bible, not as neat, tidy stories in one singular, but many chapters in this wild and fascinating library with many stories from many perspectives. Because as we know, on any given subject, these multiple stories challenge us to see life from a variety of angles. They add depth and a sense of direction and wisdom. And so we've been given four Gospels, not just one, but four, to introduce us to Jesus. We're given dozens of parables within those Gospels to illustrate the message that Jesus was bringing. And we're given two sections of Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, in which the story of God unfolds. And I have to say that for me, I know it's a story that is not finished being told. It is still unfolding in this time and this place. But here we are in the book of Genesis, and right at the beginning, we're given two different creation stories. We started with the first last week of God creating the heavens and the earth and all that lives among it in, seven, in six days and resting on the seventh day. And here today, we have this second creation story. And these two different stories help us to know who we are, where we came from, and why we're here. But according to that first creation story, you and I are part of creation. We are made from common soil, dust, Gen Genesis says. An astronomer might say stardust. There's a great children's book called You Are Stardust that says that as well. And we know that soil is an amazing thing. Soil becomes fruit and vegetables and grains that all become food that eventually become part of us as we eat them. And so we know there is a cycle that goes around and around in our world. And so we are considered highly organized dust. We are closely related to all kinds of things that creep and crawl on the earth, to frogs and turtles, lions and field mice, bison and elephants, gorillas. Together with all living things, we are connected. We share the breath of life, participating in the same cycles of birth and death, of reproduction, recycling, and renewal. We are part of the story of creation, and that is a story that is continuing to happen even right now as you listen to this. We are different branches of the tree of life as humans. And in that story, we are connected to everything everywhere. And what an amazing thing to think about. In fact, that is a good partial definition of God, if you think about it. God is the one through whom we are related and connected to everything. In that first creation story, we learn two essential truths about ourselves as humans. The first is that we're good. Isn't that nice to hear? Sometimes you just need to hear that, right? We're good. <laughs> we just need to hear that. And along with our fellow creatures, we're created with a primal and essential goodness that we all share. The second amazing thing that we understand from the creation story is that we all bear the image of God. 
and whether we identify as male or female, non-binary, trans, bisexual, gay, lesbian, powerful, vulnerable, whatever religion or Christian denomination or culture or race we identify with, we bear the image of God, and there are no exceptions to that. So, what is the image of God then? An image is a small imitation or echo, if you really want to get to the finer points of the English language, that's what it is defined as. And it can be like a reflection in a mirror. So if we bear the image of God, then like God, we experience life through relationships. And like God, we experience love through our complementary differences. Like God, we notice and enjoy and name things, starting with animals, our companions on the earth. Like God, we are caretakers of the garden of the earth, and like God, we are naked and not ashamed, meaning that we can be who we are without fear. Now, back in ancient times, this was a surprising message. Kings and other powerful men were seen as the image image bearers of God. After all, they were the rich and sophisticated and civilized people, weren't they? They were the ones who would reflect God's power and glory. But we know that wasn't necessarily always true. In fact, it was most often not true. But in Genesis, this term is applied to a couple of naked and uncivilized hunter-gatherers by today's standards. A simple woman and man living in a garden without any pyramids or skyscrapers or economies or religious or technological interventions. They didn't even have clothes, actually. And centuries later, Jesus said something similar. The creator loves every sparrow and every wildflower, and so how much more precious is every person, no matter how small and frail or seemingly insignificant. Every woman and man and child bears the image of God, and we are all good. But that's not the only story. The second creation account, which many scholars think is actually a much older one, describes another dimension to our identity as humans. That's what this whole chapter Brian McLaren's talking about is focused on, being human. In this account, the possibility of not good also exists. Here's where we're introduced to that either or, good or evil, the opposites. And God puts the first couple in a garden that contains those two special trees. It's sometimes a difficult story to think about. And the tree of life is theirs to enjoy, but not that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it seems kind of funny to us, because shouldn't we want to know about everything? Shouldn't we want to have knowledge, and shouldn't it be ours? The tree of life is such a beautiful image. It suggests health and strength and thriving thriving and growth and vigor and all of those things that mean to be alive. So what is that second tree all about then, if that first one is all about being alive? There are many answers I've read over the years, but I want you to consider this, this specific perspective that Brian McLaren offers. The second tree could represent the desire to play God, the judging part of God's creation as evil. And it can be a danger. God's judgment is wise and fair and true and restorative, while human judgment is often, more often than not, ignorant or biased, retaliatory, and devaluing. In other words, when we as humans judge, we too often misjudge. If humans start playing God and judging good and evil, how long will it be before we say this person or tribe is good and deserves to live, but that person or tribe is evil and deserves to die? Or how long will it be before we judge one species of animal as good and deserving of living on while others are interfering with our living so need to be driven to extinction? Or how long until we judge this land as good and pure, but that river to be without value and plundered, poisoned, and polluted? It's not long because it's happened already in our human history. If we eat from the second tree, we become violent and hateful and destructive, I think is what the scriptures are trying to say to us. We turn that gift that God gave us to name and know into something not so lovely. We turn it into this license to kill and exploit and destroy. God sees everything as good, including us. 
what we see more and more as evil and divisive. It's a familiar sounding story. It's happened throughout human history where people have been more prone to seeing evil than good or seeking power over being one with one another. And the danger of all this is, and the point that Brian McLaren is making with this chapter, is that when humans let these things start to take over in our lives, that's when things start to go wrong. That's when we end up with division instead of differences that we celebrate, deforestation and animals going extinct rather than flourishing wildlife admired from a distance and people seeing our natural resources as sacred and not a right for us to take. In the second creation story, it presents us with a challenge as human beings. We need to constantly make a choice in our lives about which tree it is that we eat from. Is it a good and beautiful thing to be an image bearer of God? Of course it is, but it is also a big responsibility. And we can use our intelligence that we have been given to be creative and generous or selfish and destructive. The same goes for any attributes to us, our physical strength or the work that we do, our, our finances, our time, and our innate God-given talents. We can use any and all of these to be creative and generous or destructive and selfish. And so we are forced to make choices all the time. Our hands can be clenched into fists, ready to fight, or they can be offered in the form of peace in a handshake. We're not able to do that right now. We're missing shaking hands and giving hugs, but our hands can be used as weapons or they can be used as givers of peace. I hope somewhere down the road we'll be given the opportunity again to pass the peace of Christ in church because it's one of my favorite traditions that we get to do, to no matter what is going on in our life, greet one another in peace and in hope to lay aside all of the things that might have been weighing on us in the week and to say hello and smile and to have that contact. To be alive means to bear the image of God and to bear all the responsibility that comes with this aliveness as we join together in God's creative and healing work in this world. And so I'm going to give you some homework this week. I'm going to challenge you to think more critically about choices are they harmful or helpful? Are they self-serving or life-giving? Are they creative or destructive? And unfortunately, the moment we open our eyes every single day, we're making choices, and so I'm going to be leaving you with lots of homework, I fear. But I hope that you know that even though we can't be perfect all the time, and none of us are perfect, not even Jesus was perfect, if you really look at the scriptures, Sometimes we're going to make the wrong choices or say the wrong things, but I pray that you know that no matter whether that happens or not, we always have a choice and there is always an amazing grace and forgiveness and love from our creative and giving God. Because of the example that we have in Jesus, I know this to be true. The scriptures tell us that while Jesus wasn't always perfect and didn't make the right choice every single time, he did his best and he has left our world with a legacy of faith and hope and a sense of social justice and how to be bringers of peace. The thing that Jesus taught above all is that the greatest choice we can make is to love our God with all of our heart and all of our might and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so I pray whatever choices come your way this week, that you challenge yourself to think critically about them and to think about how to be an even more loving and just and peaceful image bearer of God. For these things and the gift of these holy scriptures this day, we say thanks be to God and amen. So I'm going to invite us now into another uh, hymn. We're going to sing from our More Voices hymn book this time, and we're going to sing number 27, Creator God, You Gave Us Life. for that which makes us whole. Through 
through hands that beat majestic skies and voices chanting melody with words that reach beyond the page we comprehend your mystery in every flower and every tree we see your great diversity greater still we see your love expressed in our humanity through hands that paint majestic skies and voices chanting melody with words that reach beyond the page we comprehend your mystery when with our hearts our minds we share our gifts with all the world our spirits soar beyond the veil to touch the very face of god through hands that paint majestic skies and voices chanting melody with words that reach beyond the page we comprehend And now we turn ourselves to pray for God's people and God's world. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we know that wherever we are gathered this day, that your son Jesus told us, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. So we know that whether we are sitting at home, whether we are sitting out in your great creation outdoors somewhere, that we are together. We pray this day for all of our loved ones, for those who are celebrating, who are lifting up anniversaries and birthdays. We lift up all the everyday moments that we're soaking in right now of our creation and these last few days of the season of summer. We also know that there are many things that are on our hearts and minds and the burdens that are there. And so we lift up prayers for all of those things for all of those people who are in need of your healing love, for our friends and our family and people connected to this community of faith who are ill, for the ones who are going through treatments or awaiting test results, for those who are grieving, and for those who are seeking, who may feel lost and alone. On this day, Holy One, we lift up prayers for all your world, and in particular, we lift up prayers for teachers and caregivers, for students and board trustees, for people in positions of power who are making decisions right now about how and where our kids can safely return to systems of education. We know it's not easy, and we know that there are so many things that feel risky and make us feel fearful. We pray that all those who are doing this work would feel surrounded by the love and care that you so long for this world. And we know that they are lifted up in the light of Christ, doing the best that they can in this time that we share together of challenge and struggle in our world. May you be in all that we say and in all that we do. For we know that we bear your image. We pray that we would take that out into your world, shining that Christ light as best we can, this week and always. Oh Lord, hear our prayers, the ones that we speak out loud and the ones that are too deep for words. We gift these over to you now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. And we say, Amen. And now, my friends, we are going to go one more step along the world with another hymn. I'm going to invite you to join in song in number 639, One More Step Along the World I Go. Traveling along with 
amazing words for us to go out into whatever this day holds for us. May we go out traveling along the pathway in which God leads us. May we go out to be image bearers of God to all who we meet, and may they see the face of God in all of them. And may we go now in hope and in faith. And as we go, may our, as our worship ends, may our service in Christ's name begin. Let us go in peace, friends. Amen.